to Toronto now. We're getting more reaction so to the verdict really in the Peter Nygaard trial. Let's listen. And sometimes I'll read comments on some of these articles and I'll see people say things like, oh, how brave, you came out 30 years later. Well, you don't understand what they're up against. How would you like it if you had a massive lawsuit that they might take away your house or threaten to ruin your life if you came forward? So as Canadians, and I am a Canadian, I'm a dual citizen, we can use this situation to examine what happened and how we can look at the system to make it easier for survivors to come forward of abuse. And I want to give you something, a little scale most of you don't know. The scale of this crime and his actions, when you look at the civil suit, you look at accusers who weren't in the civil suit, former employees who wanted to come forward and don't want anything to do with money, just want to have justice. He has more formal accusations than Epstein, Weinstein, and Cosby combined. Okay, now I know we have a lawyer here, Mr. Greenspan, he's a very talented lawyer, and he's getting paid very well, and he's using his efforts here to try to get Peter Nygaard back on the streets of Toronto. But also understand that there are many others, talented lawyers, civil attorneys like Greg Gutzler and Lisa Haba, who play a critical role in this, who are working for justice. So understand that you're not alone. This is a victory for all of those in Winnipeg who came forward, who were denied justice. I'm thinking about Serena Hicks, I'm thinking about Casey Allen, April Tellick, who does have a day in court, acknowledging Shannon Maroney for her work that she's done behind the scenes, tire tirelessly working behind the scenes to help survivors, and all of those who care about justice and are open to the idea of stopping predators from abusing and targeting children, using drugs to abuse women, and using tactics like jurisdiction loopholes or threats of lawsuit to silence their victims. Given everything that you just laid out, do you ever think you'd ever sit in a courtroom and see your father here the most guilty? Do you think that would happen? Yeah, I did. A reporter asked me when I showed up here because I flew in to see him when he took the stand. They asked me when the last time I saw him was, and I thought about it, and actually it was that 2019 dinner where I saw him inappropriately touch a child. And I said something then. And I was attacked for that internally within the company and silenced, told that I was crazy. That was the last time I saw him. And since then, it's been a massive effort to seek justice. And I saw him when he first took the stand and I locked eyes again with him here after he was found guilty. And for me, it was emotional. But again, I'd like to stress, there are so many survivors out there who this is their day. How hard is it for you, though, to have your father accused of so many heinous crimes? I mean, for you emotionally, how hard? Uh, to answer your question, how hard is it for me to have my father accused of so many heinous crimes? I got zero benefit for being a whistleblower. It's not a good brand association to be the son of a monster. Um, it's negatively impacted me all across the board. I lost everything. I walked away from an inheritance to do the right thing. I have zero benefit from this other than knowing that one more child won't be affected, one more woman won't be affected, and that he has to actually now sit and think about what he's done. I loved my father. It hurts me to see all of these things. I knew a different man. I got a different version of him. And for me, that bond was real. Those moments were real. But when you get the reveal that there is another person, there's another personality within there, there's something evil in there, there's something perverse, there's something sick, and that it's out of control and that it is going to continue to abuse others and it has abused others, then you have to take action to stop that for the greater good. And not only this case, I just want to stress, it's not just about Peter Nygaard. It's about examining the system the laws and the rules to see where that problem was so that we can correct it for others in the future. That's where we'll actually get a big benefit from this tragic and terrible situation. Where do you get your character from? Do you use your character to stand up for I think I get it from my mom. <laughs> uh, I get it from my mom, uh, Patty Bickle. 
Uh, and uh, I also was really lucky to have some great role models growing up. I grew up with my mom in Washington State, and um, I spent more time with my dad as I got older, but uh, needless to say, I sort of backed away from that because he's, he's a pretty intense guy to be around. But uh, that being said, we never knew or could foresee what he was doing in his bedroom. Um, and when people are silenced, there's no way for you to know. And that's why it's so important you understand. It's, you know, there were about 13 people who knew or should have known as listed by the civil case. However, even that's going to be a drop in the bucket because how can you really know what's going on in somebody's bedroom or in his Bahamas compound, which most of this abuse happened in the Bahamas, just so you know. This was just Toronto's version that qualified. So we are dealing with a systematic monster who used his business talents for um, evil um, to prey on others and uh, and it's a very good thing that justice was served here and I hope everyone who's affected by this has a sigh of relief and also those who are affected by sex crimes to understand that please it is okay to come forward I know it's such a difficult thing you know one thing that struck me when I was at this was the women have to go up there they have to talk about this horrible experience. They have to get cross-examined. And um, meanwhile, he got to go up there, speak about his life and his accomplishments, yet we weren't told that there were all these other people who had come forward. We weren't told former employees that had nothing to do with this had come forward. These women were called gold diggers, okay, by a lawyer who is lining his pockets to as, as Shannon also uh, had mentioned to me, but it's the reality. They were called gold diggers by a lawyer who's lining his pockets to get uh, this predator back on the streets. Who was the gold digger there? Uh, I don't think it was the women. The civil suit would, played a vital role and you have a right to participate in the civil suit. I believe it was four out of five were in the civil suit. If that civil suit didn't come, this case wouldn't be here today because it gave folks an opportunity to contact a lawyer and to understand that they weren't alone and to not feel that fear of being sued, which is a, a very real thing, especially when these predators target people they know don't have the financial means or they know they have a troubled background. They're very systematic in their abuse. So, Kai, you, you spoke, one of the other reporters asked you, what was it like, did you ever think you'd see this? But you told me uh, earlier that four years ago, that's when things, when you died. When, yeah. When you witnessed something that was inappropriate. Yeah. Can you speak about how you've been, uh, like you said, blowing the whistle on, on your father yeah. uh, how bravely for four years? Yeah, this started four years ago. Um, that's where Kai Nygaard kind of died for me. Um, Four years ago, I went to a dinner party. I saw him uh, when no one was looking and I was watching touch a girl, basically assault a, a young child. And uh, I immediately called uh, Tina Tulacorpi, who is uh, one of the accused enablers in this. Uh, she was one of the executives in Toronto. And, uh, and um, it went nowhere. I just basically was called by him and then I was attacked and told that I was uh, mentally unwell and all of these things. And I got a taste of what it's like to blow the whistle against a monster or a powerful predator. You're discredited. That's the number one thing they try to do is to discredit you. And then um, once that civil suit came out, all of a sudden these floodgates of information opened up and I started to receive more information. I received information from one of his friends, which led me to believe that he was actively doing this even after the civil suit had occurred. That's information that people don't understand. And so that's what led me to contact the civil attorneys, to contact, uh, see if I could get in touch with the authorities and do every single thing that I could, no matter what happened to me and whatever standing I had within the company and what I'd worked for, because I couldn't bear the thought of another person being harmed without having their day in court. From that, the civil suit ballooned up to 57 women and children. More and more po folks came forward. A couple months later, April Tellick and Casey Allen came forward because the claim was it was only Baham Bahamians. And uh, these were uh, strong Canadian women. And then um, I had some siblings come forward. I had two brothers come forward. And uh, they very bravely decided to pursue a civil suit in part because they knew that every time the press would come out, people would feel that they weren't alone 
and more people came forward to the authorities and it was very difficult to find people who actually qualified because of the systematic abuse that he was doing it in these jurisdictions very consciously so that he couldn't be prosecuted. Um, from there, I, uh, I blew the whistle in uh, September of 2020, calling him out as a flight risk. That was my reveal within the company and, and to him that I was not on his side. That's when I was shut off from every point of contact. Um, but it was a very real threat that he would flee the country. And there was no way to stop him, even though the police had filed police reports that were sitting on the prosecutor's desk. There was months of lag time, which would have allowed him to just flee the country and go somewhere out of jurisdiction. We wouldn't be here at all right now. Um, then I participated in a, a podcast and um, documentaries um, before he was arrested, um, evil by design and unseemly, blowing the whistle some more, and then he was arrested. And then what we've done now, working with an organization called Child USA, we've developed legislation that will close that jurisdiction loophole for the USA and we want to bring that to Canada as well so that we can offer more protections for Canadians overseas who are abused. If they bring back credible evidence, they should be able to use it here instead of have it just be put on these other countries who might have unstable governments.